This afternoon, I am in Toledo, Ohio, visiting with Rick Goheen, who is the Associate Professor of Law and Assistant Dean for the La, La Valley Law Library of the University of Toledo. Rick, it's sort of our custom in these conversations to ask you a little bit about yourself as a, as a human being, a person. Could you tell us a little bit about your life, uh, perhaps not only now, but perhaps when you were younger? Okay. I, uh, I'm the oldest of five uh, children. Uh, I was born in Anderson, Indiana. Uh, moved almost immediately to Defiance, Ohio, uh, which is where my mom's family was from. Uh, mom was a nurse and then uh, school uh, crossing guard, teacher aide, cafeteria, pretty much everything you can do in a school other than being a teacher. Mm -hmm. That's what she was. Uh, my dad is a history and government uh, teacher mm -hmm. at uh, high school level. Um, Defiance itself is about halfway between Toledo and Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, it's named uh, for Fort Defiance, which was General Anthony Wayne's headquarters uh, before he campaigned up the Maumee River and beat the local Indians at the Battle of Fallen <laughs> Timbers. Um, and uh, which opened the Northwest Territory and you know, the part of the country that eventually became Ohio, Indiana, uh, Michigan, uh, Illinois, uh, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of growing up. Uh, what is life like now? Or? Um, well, you might be able to tell from the previous answer, I'm still a little bit into local history. Uh -huh. um, I've kind of translated that into uh, legislative history as mm -hmm. my thing, you know, that I like to do and, you know, that I get the most enjoyment from, you know, when I'm working with our students. Mm -hmm. um, well, you've been here at the university for about 10 years, as I recall. Hard to believe it's been yeah. 10 years, but we're coming up. Well, up in you know, it's been ten. eligible for retirement one of these days, but yeah, maybe I, not quite yet. I, I got a ways to go. Yeah, because uh, your hair hasn't changed enough. <laughs> you have to have, to have lighter gray hair, I think. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely changing. I think the beard goes first. <laughs> yeah, that does, as a matter of fact. Uh, I remember seeing friends. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're, you've been here about ten years. Do, do you have any uh, hobbies or special passions outside of work that, uh, these days? Well, I, I don't know if being a NASCAR fan counts, but I should probably I think it mention might. it. It might. <laughs> um, I actually, uh, there's one year I had season tickets at uh, Kentucky, uh, the year uh, they opened that track. You know, they started with the truck series and then they moved to the middle, you know, mid-level AAA, mm -hmm. you know, series. Then they finally got the Sprint Cup cars, and I actually got to be there for the first race in every series, which was like 10 years apart. Uh -huh. know, it took them 10 years from the time they opened the track until they got, you know, a real, you know, top series race. So I had season tickets for that. Um, another bit of trivia about Defiance is uh, Sam Hornish Jr., who is an NASCAR driver, uh, used to be, uh, he won the Indy 500, won a couple IndyCar championships, which is a totally different kind of car, but he's mm -hmm. raced both of them. He's also from Defiance, uh -huh. Ohio. Far more famous than I will ever be. What is it about this town of Defiance? <laughs> All the <laughs> experts on car racing seem to come from there. <laughs> I, I don't know. Exactly. <laughs> if you go back even further, uh, the, the four horsemen at Notre Dame, uh, you know, okay. Before, uh, you know, I think they were defensive uh, yeah. linemen. That, yeah. you know, that, that does go back quite okay. a way. And we're talking like 1920s, I exactly. think, you know, with them. Okay, so yeah. Don Miller is from Defiance. One uh -huh. of the four horsemen is ours, too. So, oh. yeah. Well, you, you know, famous background of some sort, <laughs> I guess, uh, having come from there then. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe moving on from this trivia that I'm introducing <laughs> to something a little more substantive. Uh, I know you have three degrees. Could you uh, tell us about your education, what they are in, and uh, yeah. where you got them? Uh, the, the bachelor's degree is from here mm -hmm. at the University of Toledo. Uh, it's political science. Uh, I had unofficial minors in, I think, history and sociology. Um, which we didn't actually have minors at the time, but, you know, I took enough, you know, electives, mm -hmm. you know, to get in the honorary for both of them, so I guess you could call that a minor. Um, law school was uh, Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, they tried pretty hard to keep me here, uh, but uh, 
at uh, you know pretty well recruited from Cincinnati yeah. and I had friends here who told me look if you're ever going to get out of Toledo and see a different part of the world you know then now's, now's the time to go. Well, you want about as far in this state so, as you could. I yeah guess. it's a pretty straight shot down, down I at the other end. <laughs> depending on construction. God I-75 has been on, under construction you know the whole 30 years yeah. you know since since I've been making that trip. Mm -hmm. um, library school, I got that degree while I was working at Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was at uh, the University of Kentucky, although I was only on campus in Lexington twice. Mm -hmm. uh, once for orientation and once for the comprehensive uh, final exam. The rest of that degree uh, they had a branch campus at Northern Kentucky oh. University, okay. which is right across the river. You know, short little commute after work, you're taking evening classes. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes uh, a couple of the professors were librarians at UC on the Cincinnati side. Mm -hmm. So I'm not even crossing the river, I'm just walking across campus uh -huh. uh, for a couple of those classes. And uh, Kentucky heavily subsidized their graduate degrees at that mm -hmm. point in time. Um, I think I got that whole degree for you know five or six thousand dollars. Wow! That was that was it because um, if you were in the right county in on the Ohio side, um, you got in-state tuition, and it was just an incredible, incredible deal. So you made sure you were in that county or the one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Why yeah. not? And it was it was just it was a perfect opportunity, mm -hmm. and. Uh, the people I was working with at UC at the time, you know, worked around that, you know, made it easy for me to do both things at the same time. It's a really good deal. Yeah. Our recent graduates, members in our profession and others, uh, would be appalled if they knew how little I had to pay when I was in law school and library school. The tuition, we were on the quarter system, so we had three okay. academic quarters in the academic year. You could go a summer, but I didn't. And. Uh, it was a hundred dollars a quarter. So for, that's for, for a whole it, quarter right? for the not whole thing, class, all fifteen hours. Uh, yeah. Then they raised it to one hundred and fifteen, and we were incensed. I mean, but you know, boy, they killed to get that kind of a rate now. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, any more? I think we're charging that much in just a library fee. Yeah. That's before you even get to tuition. Yeah. Well, I look at the cost you know, my grandchildren might face. You know. Glad I'm not the parents, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. Well, now, now when you were at Cincinnati as a law student, you were on the law review. Um, what kind of a role did you play in that? Uh, uh, th this uh, this is almost one of those embarrassing confession things. I was on law review. Uh -huh. Okay, barely. Um, being on there is on there. <laughs> right. Um, I I didn't do that well my first year of law school. Mm -hmm. I actually lost my scholarship because Cincinnati was doing conditional scholarships. You had to be, you know, in a certain percentage of the class or your mm -hmm. GPA had to be high enough. Um, so we get to the end of the year and uh, I, I lose the scholarship, do the write on for law review anyway, mm -hmm. and get on. And you made it. Yeah. So That's the hard I'm way. Like the <laughs> only one, you know, that they're aware of, you know, still to this day to lose the scholarship and make law review. Uh -huh. um, and then, uh, you know, so I did the site checking. And, you know, Just blame back. the quality of the professors in that first year. <laughs> well, we better maybe clip that <laughs> in case yeah, they watch yeah, it. Yeah, actually the professors were pretty good. I mean, my yeah. legal writing professor was certainly, I mean, she was, she was really good. I'd put yeah. her up against anybody I've worked yeah. with since then. Yeah. So you were on Law Review as a write-on now. Mm -hmm. It's good to so see you did the uh, site checking and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Right. Well, no wonder you're a librarian now. Well, apparently I was good enough at the writing and the site checking, you know, that it canceled out, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, the grades were part of it, too. Yeah. And uh, they put all those things together, and I, I still got on, so. Good. Well, you didn't stay there forever, so you did move on. You had your three degrees. Uh, and you, uh, so why don't we talk about your career, uh, Rick? Um, I noticed when I was sort of doing my own background work on this thing, or maybe you slipped me some information, or however I found out about this, that your first uh, job out of law school was in a, as a reference librarian at the University of Cincinnati Law Library. So you stayed sort of close to your law school home at that I point. Um, and during that time, 
my notes indicate is when you were working on the library degree while you were living in Cincinnati mm -hmm. but, and studying on sort of their right. across the river uh, right. department it, or uh, something. Could you tell us a bit about uh, that period of your life and work? Yeah, it uh, started off as a halftime position. Uh, mm -hmm. They, um, I'm not sure how the previous halftime reference librarian uh, departed. Uh, I know the position was open. Mm -hmm. I had worked uh, as a student at the circulation desk uh, mm -hmm. most of the time that I was in law school. And when I was an undergraduate here at the circulation desk in this library. Um, so I had a bunch of student experience. Um, that uh, you know the the librarians there you know knew me pretty well by then, and uh, Jim Hart, who was the head of public services, you mm -hmm. know, called me up and he's like, "We've got this opening, you know, would would you be interested?" Which was kind of a surprise to me because I thought you had to have both degrees, you know, to do uh, a reference librarian job in a law library. Um, found out fairly quickly that that wasn't necessarily the case, right. um, that you could start with one or the other and, you know, get the yeah. one you didn't have. And uh, so it started off as a 20-hour a week position, and then it became 30, and then it became 40. I gradually, mm -hmm. you know, made myself more useful as mm -hmm. I was working on the degree. Perhaps having it start off as maybe part-time, half-time, was a little more compatible mm -hmm. with your continuing studies. I, I think it was. Uh, yeah. wasn't so compatible with my bank account, but... Uh, yes, it doesn't pay quite like a full-time full position. We, you know, we, we've already, you know, talked about library school having been so inexpensive, so you yeah. put all of those things together and yeah those things all at the same time just worked yeah. out really well for me. Well, I worked the same way when I was in library school. I was the night reference librarian at the uh, you know, law library okay. and I had started off as student assistant like you did and uh, uh, that one did pay me enough to pay my own expenses which were modest in those days because everything was. Uh, but it also kind of kept me level of, because the library school curriculum, I, I was not always impressed with the, some of the courses. So this was the real world I had another hand in, and that kept me sane. <laughs> Maybe I, I should clip this out in case any <laughs> of the library school people see it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah I, I, I kind of have mixed feelings on that. I, mm -hmm. I think law school was probably you know, a more difficult you know, oh, experience. Oh, very definitely. I think we all agree on that. Um, in terms of you know the work I put into it and how much I probably cared about the subject matter and, and what I mm -hmm. felt like I was learning, I think library school was a better experience and maybe we should edit that part out. Um, but by then, you know, I was working in a library while going to library school, so mm -hmm. those things make sense together. Yeah. Um, and that happened in a way that I think doesn't happen so much. I mean, because you can't be a lawyer while you're in law school. Mm -hmm. um, it just doesn't work that way. Um, whereas for some of us, for, for many of us, I think, you can work as an almost librarian yeah. before you've got the library degree just because our profession is that specialized and you learn it well enough while you're mm -hmm. in law school, at least the, the bibliography and the blue book yeah. part of it. Now, you mentioned you started off half-time when you were in the reference position. Eventually they added not only more hours to your work and presumably helped you uh, financially survive, uh, but you became head of reference. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about that that step and some of what that was all about? Well, I, I still sort of look at it as gradually making myself more useful, you know, uh, not refusing to do a lot of things that were asked of me. Um, it uh, started off a, as an interim had a reference uh, mm -hmm. thing. Uh, Mariano Morales Lebron, who was the head of reference at the time, uh, took a sabbatical. Mm. Uh, and that was probably about the same time that I finished library school. Um, so we need somebody to, you know, do the reference schedule and do some of the coordination, you know, kind of work. And I was available and, you know, the logical person to, to be doing that. Um, I'd worked, you know, with Mariano, you know, quite a bit, um, you know, spent a lot of time in his office, you know, mm -hmm. just kind of soaking in the information well, and, sure. and, and his Learn his any way you can. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, so that, that worked out pretty well for, for everybody, really. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, he came back and uh, retired 
uh, maybe a year after that. Okay. Yeah. And uh, that uh, then then the position became a little more permanent um, at that point. Yeah, I suppose when he was on sabbatical and he was going to come back, that sort of put a damper on permanent uh, status. Uh, well, it for a while. it did, it did. But yeah. you know, I don't know how well he planned this, but. Mm. Uh, you know, I count Mariano as one of my mentors okay. uh, in, in that sense. You know, I, he's where I learned how to keep a big secret because I, he told me he was likely to retire uh -huh. pretty soon when he came back off the sabbatical. But he said, you can't tell anybody. Well, so I, I didn't tell anybody. he didn't want to be a lame duck any sooner than he needed to be, especially at uh, salary setting time. Well, that that had that had a couple of effects because one, I I viewed it as kind of a test for me. You know, can I keep my mouth shut? Yeah. But the other, you know, knowing that that position was gonna come open, mm -hmm. you know, gave me a different perspective on it because I'm like, you know, I can work at this, you know, and mm -hmm. learn everything I can in order to be able to do that job. And, and make it a no-brainer, make them not want to give it to anybody else mm -hmm. um, when the time comes. And uh, he probably intended that, you know, to some degree. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that, that's another one that worked out really well. Okay. You probably have already answered this, but I want to be clear on whether you have or haven't or whether there's more. Uh, I like to ask if there was uh, how you happened to be recruited into our profession or into our branch of the legal profession, um, and did anyone in particular play, a, or more than one, play a role in, the, in sort of recruiting? Yeah. There, there are several, um, mm -hmm. and I would have to start with Janet Wallen, okay. who was the library director here uh, for 30 years, mm -hmm. uh, 1963 to 93, I think it was. And uh, she was still the director, you know, when I was uh, a student working at her circulation desk. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, saw a work-study job available on the job board, you know, and, and her number was listed as the contact. I, I called her up, mm -hmm. and uh, she referred me to Ted Potter, who was the head of public services, and probably where I should have started, but, you know, hey, I had her name and her number. Well, you did exactly what the thing said, contact so, her. She's so the top... I, top person, why not? <laughs> I, I did that and, uh, and Ted interviewed me uh -huh. and uh, that, that seemed to go pretty well. Um, yeah, there was a lot of, you know, the, the library operated a little differently then, uh, you know, much more print oriented. Uh -huh. um, we had a don't reshelve your books rule, which meant that we had books all over the library yeah. every day, all over the place. Yeah. And so that's kind of how I learned, you know, the collection and learned how a law library operates. Was well, I was out there shelving the books yeah. every day, you know. Well, there was a practical a reason for that, as you probably well know. The, the people would sometimes see a hole and throw the book in any old place. Oh, yeah. Well, the next person comes along, where's that book? Well, nobody could find it. <laughs> sometimes they do it intentionally. Absolutely. Get you know, that. you get yeah. caught stealing it out of the library. Uh, you might get an mm -hmm. honor code problem or right. something. And, if you uh, just misplace it, uh, you can plead stupidity and ignorance and probably get away with it. <laughs> you could. You could. I mean, to this day, I think, you know, what I learned here, you know, uh, things like, you know, where the most likely place for a book to get misshelved uh -huh. is. Okay, you know, if it's not in KF 420, well, look for it in K 420 and see if it's there. Yeah. And sometimes, sometimes it will You say be. nothing of one shelf above and one shelf below and all the other tricks. All of those things. Yeah. All of those things. Yeah. And uh, I don't think you really learn that if you don't have mm -hmm. to, you know, be out there in the stacks working with it and shelving it every day. So did Ted or uh, who kind of recruited you into the field then? Uh, or was it just well, sort of... You it, liked what you saw, and that's how they did it. Or it, it was a combination of both of them. Um, I had, you know, I was working, you know, as close to 20 hours a week and uh -huh. closer to 40 during the summers yeah. uh, as, as a student here. Sure. And, and this is going to sound crazy, but I, mean, I was doing things like reading the AAAL directory and handbook. It was mm -hmm. on reserve at the circulation desk. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, this looks interesting. Let's see how this profession works. And sure. and you you pick up some of that stuff. You know, yeah. like by the time I got to Kano, I already knew what all the committees and SISs were. Big yeah. I, I know that's weird, but 
Well, not as much as you think, because I mean, you're on duty as a, at the circulation desk. You know, you're not that busy every hour of the time you're on duty. What do you do to sort of pass the time um, without getting yourself into trouble and right. reading some of the collection and learning something about mm -hmm. the discipline or the or the the profession itself or whatever? It's, it's not that un I mean, unlikely to be one way to fill time. Right. Well, that, that's one way I did yeah. it. And they, they gave me a lot of leeway, you know, when I was, uh, you know, shelving books, you know, if yeah. I'm at it for like an hour or so. And I picked up a book that I thought was interesting, you know, mm -hmm. they were okay with me, you know, spending a couple of minutes and browsing through it or maybe pulling it, you know, for myself to yeah. check it out and, and, and take it with me. Um, and I need to, uh, well, maybe need is too strong a word, but I mean, Professor Wallen, uh, was a mentor to several people who okay. became library directors. I mean, there's at least seven of us that I know of. Well, that's sort of a successful uh, mentor or recruiter for our at, field. At one point, uh, uh -huh. you know, one of whom I got to work with, you know, really closely later on in my uh -huh. career. Um, I am, as far as I know, the last one you know, in, in that line. Mm -hmm. And I barely qualified because I was an undergraduate student, you know, at oh. the time. But every so often, you know, I mean, like a Friday afternoon when the library is basically cleared out, but she's still in her office, you know, mm -hmm. and I'm like delivering a book or something. And, and she, you know, she'd pull me in and, and, and have a little chat. And yeah, I don't think she was trying to turn me into a law librarian. But, you know, you, you remember those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. and. And the feeling of you know knowing that there's someone in the building who is really really good at their job and they like what they do, and everybody in the building and you can feel the respect for her. Mm -hmm. um, there was one year our the law school dean became the interim president because the mm -hmm. president you know left for another job in the middle of the year or whatever. Yeah. So law school dean becomes the interim president. She's on the search committee for who the new president is going to be, like it was normal, mm -hmm. you know, and she just, you know, set that kind of example, you know, for, for she everybody. She must have been high, highly regarded on the campus, uh, she, she be was. put in, as a faculty appointee to that and, committee. And, and I didn't even know, you know, I mean, yeah. I would have, you know, more, you know, a better perspective on it now, I suppose, if, mm -hmm. if I were to, to see that, but well, you've been looking back. Around the... Uh, a circuit a little bit more now than when you were our first <laughs> undergraduate bit, yeah. student. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have any other uh, any others you consider uh, mentors besides uh, her? Yeah. Um, you know uh, Taylor Fitchett, who was the okay. director at Cincinnati. Yeah. Um, now both, in Virginia. Uh, yeah. Well, Virginia's at Wayne State now. Um, she's oh. no longer at Cincinnati. Um, no, I'm, I'm thinking of Taylor. Oh, oh, right, right. right. Virginia. See, yeah, Virginia, Virginia. I have had that problem. Yeah. Thanks to both Taylor and Virginia. Yeah. Uh, for for years, and I'm like, okay, which Virginia am I talking about? Right, right. Taylor's at the University of Virginia yeah. now. It was a nice appointment for her. She's it, been it there was. quite a while now too. It was, I and mean, she's mm -hmm. done really well with that job. Um, yeah, there was a little bit of a conspiracy, I think, between her and the Cincinnati admissions director. Mm -hmm. um, when I went for my visit to law school, they made sure I had lunch with Taylor. And uh, I know this is probably standard procedure. I mean, anything that Not the admissions guy can come <laughs> up with. Yeah. But, you know, knowing that I, you know, worked here, you know, in the law library, that was a very smart thing for them to have, uh, have done. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we, we had some interesting days the couple of years that, that I was there working with, with Taylor. Was Gordon Christensen, uh, I know he was on faculty, was he mm -hmm. dean still at that point? He had been out of the dean's office for maybe two years. Okay. Uh, but I did have him for Com Law too. He was my professor okay. for that class. He was my first dean when I went to America, and that's why. Oh, okay. Bert Lockwood was an assistant dean or associate right. dean or something, and he later, and I think mm -hmm. he may still be active. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Bert is still running the Human Rights Institute. Yeah, that was his at, field. At uh, Cincinnati, and that sort of became my field as a librarian uh, mm -hmm. after I'd been there a couple of years. 
I was the liaison for the human rights program, so I'm helping them look for all these UN documents and trying to figure out what all these codes mean and when they can't, <laughs> you know, they need a statute from Uganda Barely or something. Barely staying ahead of the curve just to... Yeah, not, it was, yeah. I mean, that, that was, that was a stretch. I, I think that program is a stretch for everybody that has anything to do with it. Because mm. it just, it, it makes your, it makes your world bigger. Yeah. You know, you are dealing with things and researching things that you never knew existed or could even be a problem, and you're trying to help figure out a way to fix it. Well, Christensen's one of his fields was uh, international law, as it was called sort of broadly in the days when he was an American. And uh, uh, one time, I, uh, I don't know, I was buying something, and the tax professor uh, who's now gone so I don't have to worry about protecting her. <laughs> uh, she found out I had turned down some or hadn't bought some tax material that she had decided to, she discovered this finally. We, oh we couldn't live without it. Well we've been living without it for a long time and mm -hmm. she argued why are you spending money on international law instead of uh, tax? And, you know there isn't such a thing. Well I think even she realized a little later that that was not quite the case. <laughs> well, it's become even more the case since then. Well, very much, yeah. especially the profession. Uh, I mean, the, the trade is so internationalized now. And, uh, right, right. Business. And, and you have, you know, law firms, you know, buying each other and merging, you know, across yes. borders and across oceans. Very much, yeah. And... Yeah, no longer do you have to be a citizen, not only of the country, but of the state to be a member of the bar. Mm -hmm. As many of them were a few years back now, right. so it's a whole different uh, arrangement, uh, very much. Well, you were at Cincinnati a while, but in 2001, uh, you went to, uh, left the University of Cincinnati and moved to uh, Colwell, Minnesota, to be the Associate Director of Public Services at the University of St. Thomas. You were there mm -hmm. for, until about 2007. Yep. And in preparation for this, I'll fess up, uh, University of St. Thomas, oh, I thought of the one in Warmall, Florida, and you had to suggest we correct that in the script. <laughs> and mm -hmm. thank you for doing so. Well, so yeah. You were the one up north, the cold right, one. Right, <laughs> right, and 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 that's that that's our fault, you know, the ones up north, because there wasn't this problem until they opened a law school yeah. in, in Minnesota. Well, you know, part of my problem in doing the background on people for this, uh, um, for these uh, conversations, is the fact that a number of the tools that I have used in the past or could have used have been discontinued. You mentioned the directory and the handbook of uh, AALL. That's not available in print anymore. First, the directory mm -hmm. part survived for a while, but the handbook disappeared because right. of the costs. And now, for about two years, we haven't had a printed directory. And it's, uh, uh, I, I've lobbied to you know, maybe rethink that. But the, you can search the uh, online database in strange ways. But you know, if somebody's you retires and gives up their membership, they get dropped from the current database. <laughs> right, right. Well, and it was always, you know, easier, I mean, like a lot of things are still easier to do in a book. Yeah. If I wanted to know who all the law librarians were at the other eight law schools in Ohio, mm -hmm. for instance, that's a lot easier to do by pulling the, the, the paper directory off the shelf. I think you so, know, too. Going to the Ohio pages, okay, here's the ones in Cleveland, here's the ones in mm -hmm. Cincinnati, you know, oh, I didn't know that person was there now. Yeah. Um, and you would never do that, you know, by uh, a search in the online version. All the information is yeah. there, but it's a completely different experience. Well, and you can just find the all the librarians in, um, say, Ohio or something, but you'll get a whole bunch of pages printed out, and you'll have to go through all the names. It isn't, mm -hmm. as, it isn't organized in quite as convenient a fashion for the kind of search you just described. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. Another thing is that, uh, you know, with the exception of some of the academic directors, probably most if not all, who are also in the director of law teachers, uh, uh, we used to have occasionally in the past a biographical directory of law librarians. Right. So it was not popular, though, with many of the members. Uh, hmm. I think partly because the profession had changed and 
certain people had different sorts of credentials than others, and that kind of brought it out a little more than okay. perhaps many who were comfortable okay. with. Hey, you wish that people, you know, wouldn't care about that so much, but, but I can certainly but see they how people do. would. Yeah. I mean, because I know there are, you know, academic directors who don't have both degrees still. Yeah. Sure. Okay, some of the best academic law librarians I've ever met, okay, you would never know they don't have a JD. That's right. Best people I've ever met, yeah. both in and out of the library and, and the classroom. That's right. Or we and even have some librarian colleagues who are very highly regarded, and for good reason in our field, whom I know, who do not have any college degrees. That I was a lot more common when I was young and new mm -hmm. in the field, but uh, it still is not, shall we say, uh, an unheard of uh, right. situation. Right. It's a little bit of a surprise when you get, you know, the background yeah. story or somebody tells you. So the most but, yeah. recent, I think, of these biographical directors was printed uh, back in the early 90s, 1993, I think. Right. And, so and they weren't about, every right. year. I mean, the, the previous one was some years before that, and there were maybe about, there have been about five of them, I think, that I know of over the years. Mm -hmm. But and I, this is my thing, because I'm trying to do a little background research on people that we want to invite to include in the project, and uh, it's harder and harder to find, <laughs> find that kind of information. Yeah. Although websites are great, because people do put a lot of stuff up on some of their websites uh, mm -hmm. for their schools, and that, that is a godsend. Yeah. So, you know, you get you win one and it, uh, it does. Yeah, that, that one's kind of a mixed blessing, I think, because yeah. you hope that people will share that information. But I know I've edited mine, you know, and the longer I'm here, the less of the older stuff is there. I edit the thing down. Yeah. Because I, I don't know that the older stuff matters as much anymore. Well, I've noticed that in doing research. I'll get the curriculum vitae and then I'll go back or, or it'll be summarized and I'll go back to see, well, what was in the original, the old biographical directories, and uh, sometimes I will pick up things that weren't in the other. Well, let's now move to Minnesota. You moved to Minnesota, and you were at the University of St. Thomas. Now, you worked with some interesting colleagues who, I, you know, did. are sort of somebody's in our field. They, some of them. they are. And, and, Can we talk and a little was, bit about your job, that was, the experiences there, and some of these people? Yeah, that, that, and I'll, I'll just say that, that was intimidating uh -huh. uh, for me at, at first. And I'm, I'm mostly over the intimidation factor now. I've been a director <laughs> for almost experience. 10 years. Right, <laughs> right. But uh, yeah, I, 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 I want to back up, you know, even to, uh, you know, when I found, how I found out about the job. Mm -hmm. um, I get a phone call out of the blue on a Wednesday afternoon. Uh, I think it was afternoon, it might have been morning, from, from Ed Edmonds. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, I'm, one of my I'm, I'm, I'm not in the office, and, and he leaves a message. And the message is basically, um, you know, we've got this position in St. Thomas. You might have heard about us. Here's the website. Um, if you have any interest in the job, you know, give me a call. Mm -hmm. All right, okay, that's interesting. You know, because, I mean, I don't know it. Um, <laughs> you do now. I, I do. Yes. Um, and and, and I, 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 I spent the next two days, basically, okay, I didn't call him back until Friday, okay, for one thing, I'm doing my own background research, thinking, okay, is this for real? Um, is, is, <laughs> Who is, is this guy? Is, is, is he real? real? He was real, yeah. um, you know, I think at that point, he'd already been SEAL president and uh, ALSIS uh, president or chair, whichever yeah. it was at the time, um, and he had the connection to Toledo and to Professor Wallen, uh -huh. um, which, you know, I learned more about later. Um, so, you know, I'm spending 48 hours or so thinking, if I call this guy back, I could end up, I'm going to be in Minnesota, you know, because <laughs> um, that's just how it felt, you know, and, and I don't usually go on field, but sometimes you do anyway, and, and this, this was one of those times. Um, and it turns out, I think Margie was just coming off of her year as president. Margie Mays. Double A, double L. Um, and uh, we had another connection who was uh, Ruth Lavore, okay. who uh, had been a reference librarian at Cincinnati when I was a student there, and then she moved to San Diego. Apparently she and Ed knew each other. 
Mm -hmm. um, that might have had something to do with the baseball caucus. I'm not entirely sure on that, but I think that was part of the connection. <laughs> He's still involved in baseball, you know. Very much so. With, with uh Frank Hodak, yeah. among other things. Well, and he's like, yeah, he's like an actual member of the Society of American Baseball mm -hmm. Researcher, I think is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I was getting, you know, pretty good indications, you know, from from the beginning. Uh, we set up the interview, and, and that went, you know, pretty well. And before long, you know, yeah, I'm I'm in Minnesota, mm -hmm. um, working with you know, these people who I then and now, you know, look up to, um, you know, Ed and, and Margie, you know, we've already mentioned, uh, Patty Satzer came over as head of technical mm -hmm. services, and she already had that job at William Mitchell, and it's like, okay, why would you make that move, mm -hmm. you know, unless there was something good going on here, she's got a great job where she was, um, and I think, uh, you know, he, they managed to pull together, I mean, they bring Margie over from the University of Minnesota, Patty from William Mitchell. Uh, soon after that, we got Mickey Scholl, who was the catalog, cataloger at Hamlin. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're pulling, you know, one great librarian from the other three po schools. Po poaching all the best yeah, people. that's the word for <laughs> poaching, literally poaching. <laughs> Um, well, there's one way to build a staff, I guess. Hey, it, Good it, it, it worked. It worked really well. Yeah. Um, you know, I had the chance, you know, and everything we did, you know, was a group decision. I mean, Ed mm -hmm. was, was really inclusive on, on that. Yeah. I and mean, I remember things like, you know, he didn't even want to put a door on his office because the rest of us were going to be in cubicles and somebody finally convinced him, look, you're going to have to have a private conversation now and then. One of you needs a door and it might as well be you. <laughs> um, so he accepted the door. Um, I got to hire uh, two reference librarians, you mm -hmm. know, to fill out the staff, uh, you know, the first year. Uh, I got Mary Wells, who was, uh, she'd been a private firm librarian a couple of places in mm -hmm. Minnesota, and she had like 20 years in at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, Trina Tinglum, who was, uh, I think she was a Westlaw rep at that point. So on the one hand, I've got, you know, my firm research, you know, how do you find things under pressure and on deadline with insistent people? Mm -hmm. um, and Trina covers uh, what I thought of as my electronic research teaching weakness. Mm -hmm. um, the West Law expert. Uh. Yeah, well, uh, okay, I, I started off as more of a Lexus guy, yeah. um, and that goes back a little bit of history here, too. Mm -hmm. When I was here as a student, we had one Westlaw terminal and two Lexus terminals yeah. well, uh, for, for the whole school. Basically, s pretty much started in Ohio. They, they did. They yeah, did. Omar they, and then uh, was right. headquartered so a down in Columbus Dayton. Columbus and then a Dayton yeah. uh, project. And we had two Lexus terminals because uh -huh. the paralegal program was paying for part of the second Lexus terminal. Okay. Which meant that if I wanted to go play, um, you know, that one of the Lexus terminals was more likely to be available mm -hmm. um, than the Westlaw one. And, uh, you yeah, know, I got pretty good at changing the roll of paper, you know, and, and troubleshooting the printer and, and all that. I had twice as much of that to do on Lexus as I did yeah. uh, on Westlaw. Um, so, yeah, I was a little stronger in Lexus mm -hmm. at that point. And, uh, you know, Trina covered that for me. And, uh, you know, Mary and Trina and, I mean, but really all of us, okay, we put together uh, a legal research curriculum, mm -hmm. you know, figured out how we wanted to teach it, um, you know, who was going to teach what piece of it. Um, I guess we were into our second year at that point. The first year, it was Ed and I throwing things together. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes on a Monday night before we were both going to have to go teach a Tuesday uh, morning class. Oh, got it done. <laughs> and, and, and we did. That was the first time that I'd ever really, you know, had to teach and been really responsible. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the class on my own. I mean, prior to that, it had been, yeah, you, know, you got a couple of weeks to do a PowerPoint that you're only going to have to deliver once. Yeah. Um, and when you're starting up a new law school, you know, everybody's got to have multiple hats. Yes. And I probably would have taken the job anyway if I had known that there was going to be that much teaching involved. 
and I'm not sure Ed really knew that at the time either because everything was evolving yeah. at the beginning. Um, but uh, you know, I, I got good at it eventually. Um, we team taught those classes. Uh, Loring Skills was a, a team effort between mm -hmm. a writing professor and a research librarian, uh, whichever mm -hmm. that happened to be. I mean, Ed had a section of his own as yeah. well. And uh, I still think that's the best of all worlds, the best possible way to teach legal research and to get it into your students' mm -hmm. brains. You know, it was an extravagant use of personnel resources because basically the class had two professors. Yeah. Um, and uh, whenever one of us was teaching, the other one was in the room. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, chiming in, you know, asking, you know, more pointed questions mm -hmm. than maybe the class had had, had thought of well, on their own. the students were benefiting from some oh, of that were. dialogue between the two. They totally were, and, and reinforcing the idea that uh, the writing professor and the librarian both knew what they were doing, what they were talking about. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, Mitchell Gordon, uh, was one of the professors and he was the program writing program director uh, okay. for a couple of years that I was there um, and, and he I mean the first couple of times he did it um, it was kind of a surprise and then once I figured out what he was up to um, I mean he almost got Socratic with me I thought he was trying to trip me up oh um, and, and and it wasn't you know I mean he had something that he thought the class needed to learn a little better and he was asking the question in a different way so instead of picking on a student he picked on you <laughs> right and you know, of course I rose to the challenge you know uh, Good. and uh, it, it worked out really well uh, mm -hmm. for, for everybody but uh, yeah yeah and some of the best uh, classroom experiences I've ever had, mm -hmm. you know, were, were there at St. Thomas, and I don't know if I'll ever get to duplicate that again. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you were all sort of enjoying running the, the library and the program and the, the mm -hmm. teaching legal research and writing. Um, you said earlier that you sort of all got together and collaborated, I think that's my term, um, for um, a lot of the decisions, and mm -hmm. that's a nice feeling to be considered you know important enough to be at the table yeah well speaking for of a new guy you know um, for the first year that we were there mm -hmm. uh, because the the faculty was so small uh -huh. um, and eventually this this idea faded away but they included the librarians uh, in the faculty meetings mm -hmm. and you know discussing the professors who were possibly going to get hired you know for the second and, and third years yeah. in part because I mean if nothing else they needed warm bodies you know to fill the room and, and, and do the interviews yeah. and, and ask the questions um, but you've got everybody in on the ground floor trying to build this thing knowing that if we don't do this right we're not going to have any students coming in the door mm -hmm. uh, the first day um, and as it turned out, I mean, a lot of it was timing, a lot of it was planning, a lot of it was just getting a group of really good people in mm -hmm. there. You know, I think we had like 120 students that had signed up to be part of that inaugural class and all 120 of them showed up. That would never happen, mm. you know, anymore. And they're all coming to a new law school and taking this huge risk. I mean, we're not accredited yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, St. Thomas did everything right, you know, on the administrative side of it to make that more likely to happen. There's no guarantee. But still, until it happens, nobody is absolutely certain it right. will. Right. And I know other law schools that students took chances on and even faculty going there and they didn't mm -hmm. make it. Right. Right. And, yeah. and St. Thomas did. I mean, it's, it's been there 15 years now. Uh-huh. A little more than that. And it's... Yeah. It's an incredible thing, I and mean, it was the fourth law school in a three law school town. Yeah, well, that's the other thing. You had some pretty, uh, <laughs> some pretty good competition, like the University of Minnesota, for right. example. <laughs> right, and uh, William Mitchell, that had been around you yeah. know, for for years. Um, you know, Hamlin, which had some real strengths in mm -hmm. alternative dispute and, and mediation, you know, type things. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, eventually, I think uh, last year, you know, Hamlin and Mitchell merged. Yes, I know. So now they're back down to three law schools yeah. uh, in, in Minnesota. Yeah. 
but uh, I think they did manage to keep the best of both of those schools. Mm -hmm. and, and moving forward, they'll, they'll have that. Yeah. Well, should we move on? You moved on in 2007, came here, and bingo, 10 years roughly. You know. Yeah, where 2016 did, now as we're talking. Where did, where did that go? Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, startups don't last forever. Uh -huh. um, you know, there's kind of an entrepreneurial feel to the place that, that you can't really, you can't really keep. And I think almost everybody who started there, I mean, there's maybe a half dozen faculty that were at St. Thomas in the first, you know, two or three years uh -huh. uh, that are still there. Um, and, and a lot of other people have, have moved on. Uh -huh. uh, Ed Edmonds was one of those. Who moved on? I mean, he got the you know best opportunity ever, mm -hmm. uh, at least in in my opinion. Um, and That's I, right. It would have been in 2006. Uh, Notre Dame. Well, he and I kind of did the same thing yeah. a year apart. We've both gone back to our undergraduate alma maters to yes. run the law school. Yeah. He's library. retiring. I understand. He is at the end, of, at year, the end yeah. of of December. And, yeah. uh, well, that's right. Um, it's a mid-year retirement. I, yeah. I've heard of several others. Uh, mm -hmm. the two at the University of Houston, the uh, director and the associate director are both uh, retiring. I got an email from her, uh, okay. the associate, mm -hmm. uh, in well, December. Uh, I don't know. Well, <laughs> that's uh, it's going to be interesting times. Yeah. You know, for that. But anyway, uh, where where I was headed uh, with with Ed and his moving on. Mm -hmm. um, was uh, you know I was going to have a new boss mm -hmm. you know regardless of, of what what I did you know whether I stayed put or whether I you know found another opportunity somewhere else. You gotta get a new boss one way or the other unless you happen to go to another right. day. And they right. weren't looking at the moment. No, no, they they weren't. Um, uh -huh. And 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 some things I mean you can't really recreate. You know I mean uh, yeah, yeah it would be different. It it would be. Um, so. Uh, I believe it was uh, the, our annual meeting in 2006 mm -hmm. in St. Louis. And, uh, you know, the timing works out pretty well for me because, you know, Ed had just left um, yeah. that, that summer. Um, Nancy Strohmeyer, uh, who had been Ed's head of public services at Loyola, New Orleans, um, had, her family's from St. Louis, and it was like her brother-in-law's house or something. Anyway, she had, a, you know, invited a few people over mm -hmm. one night. Um, and, and, and I'm on the list, you know, somehow being a sufficiently a friend of Ed, I guess. Mm -hmm. and, and Nancy and I knew each other reasonably well by then, too. Um, and uh, actually, uh, Dick Spinelli was there yeah. that night. And, and you know how he goes around collecting information. And he, well, he well, knows. That was why he was so valuable <laughs> that he'd come visit. I mean, we already bought the stuff high and sold. Right. So, so we didn't need Dick to sell right. us anything. We yeah, needed Dick to tell his, us a few things. His, his job is making, feel, making people feel good about yeah. the money they were already spending. Yeah. And, and he, <laughs> we're getting our money's worth. <laughs> does he, yeah, uh, an amazing job of that. And I barely knew Dick at that yeah. point, in, in fact. Uh, but, but I did hear him say, oh, you know, the Toledo job just opened up. Okay, and th this wasn't directed at me. I don't think he even knew, you know, <laughs> that I was from Toledo or was interested. And I don't think he and I talked about it much, at least not that. He night. may have known more than you think. Well, probably pretty well informed guy. Probably my experience with him. But he, he's also not pushy, you know. I mean, well, you know, no, so, that's the charm. I mean, he, yeah, it's it's really a, a, a thing. Um, so I spent the rest of the time in St. Louis, you know, like mm -hmm. talking to people and it's like, do I really want to do this? You know, what, what am I jumping into? Is yeah. this, is this even a job I can get? Because at that point I'd been an associate director for, I guess, five years. Yeah. Well, that's um, a good which time, is, good experience, you know, and now uh, you're ready to move up. Well, apparently. At least you hope so. <laughs> I hope they think so. So, uh, you know, a couple of months later, I get a call from Doug Ray, who mm -hmm. was the dean here. Um, he'd been a professor here during my first, you know, tour of, of duty. Mm -hmm. um, of course, again, you know, I was just an undergraduate student. He wouldn't have any reason to remember me, but he would certainly see that on my resume and CV and, and, uh, and at least think it was interesting. Um, so uh, we set up an interview for, I think it was mid-January. Mm -hmm. um, 
but he also said, well, I see, you know, you're, you're from Ohio, you know, you probably got family here. If you happen to be in the neighborhood over the holidays, give me a call. Um, so, you know, uh, I would have been an idiot not to. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I, I called him up, I think it was like the morning, uh, December 26th, mm -hmm. like the day after. Um, or maybe I had it set up a little ahead of time. Anyway, however that thing happens, the day after Christmas, okay, mm -hmm. and Doug and I are sitting in his office taking a tour of the law school, which I'm pretty sure was the real interview, but I didn't know it at the time. <laughs> it probably was. Um, but uh, having been at St. Thomas at a startup and being as mm -hmm. involved in that as I was, um, gives you, gave me a little different perspective than I think most associate directors would get. I mean why would a head of public services ever care about the law school's tuition discount rate? Mm -hmm. But when you're at a startup, these things get talked about, yeah. and, and they matter. Um, and, uh, you know... As you say, when you're, everybody's doing a little of everything, you learn a lot. You do. Mm -hmm. You really do. Uh, things like, you know, I, I don't think I ever would have set up a loan rule table. Uh -huh. Okay, except that we had to do that, you know, because we were a new library and had to figure out what are all these rules and how do they fit together. That was mostly Patty Satzer, but mm -hmm. she and I worked on that together. Um, and, you know, she was like, okay, here's how this rule works and, and here's what we have to do to code it that way. Now, what do you really want to do? And, and she and I are having this conversation. Okay, what are the possible consequences if we do that? What else is that going to affect? And mm -hmm. Just... Yeah, I, I think you only get that experience once. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think that ever happens well, it again. it sounds like a fascinating uh, part of your whole overall uh, career. It, uh, it was. Yeah. It really was. So you so sort of bring back, you're, you're being recruited to come yeah, we, here. Now you've had this um, we, we chat got, with the dean or... Yeah, and... and yeah, it, it, which you think maybe it was a little more than just a chat. <laughs> well, and, and it went really well. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think really good interviews, you know. I mean, there's there's recruiting going both ways. Yeah. You, know. you must have known you were experienced enough to not be put off by the fact that this is all the middle of winter <laughs> that they're bringing you around. <laughs> right. And, and it can be like, a tad chilly up in this part yeah. of the world. Well, and i just been in the year. Six, five, six years in Minnesota, you know, yeah. and the snow doesn't bother me anymore. And I, I grew uh, up driving in snow, yeah. you know. West Ohio, you, you learn that pretty quickly, or you're just not functioning. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the pre-interview, you know, went well enough, yeah. you know, that I felt pretty good about the official interview mm -hmm. uh, a couple weeks later uh, in, in January, and, and that had all of the elements, you know, that a, a normal faculty library director interview. Uh, so you would, met would with have. the faculty. Uh, Individually, right. I presume, or in small groups? Right, uh, mostly uh, small groups. Okay. Uh, met with the library staff, you know, also, uh, I think there was a breakfast in the morning, you know, yeah. continental thing with, with all the library staff, and then smaller groups later in the day, in this room, actually. Mm -hmm. I think I was sitting where you're sitting oh. uh, for, for that, uh, that part of the interview. Um, we got to the job talk, and, um, you know, the professor job talks usually they're like presenting a paper, you know. Yeah. I know. I've in in the case sat through of a few of them just a few, days. yeah, as yeah. Uh, as many as we had people as we hired at St. Thomas, yeah. Which was another thing, you know, having seen so many of those, and we were in the middle of the process for hiring Ed's successor. Uh huh. Okay, so I'd seen I'd been through a lot of job talks. Yeah. By that point. Um, and there was a there was a prompt, you know, there was a specific thing that they wanted their candidates to talk about mm -hmm. in the job talk, and and I did that, okay. But I only used maybe ten minutes out of the fifty that, mm -hmm. that I had, um, and then then I went a little a little wild. Um, I I I played Jeopardy with the faculty mm -hmm. here, and 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 what I told them was, you know, okay, how we've you know gone through, you know, this first 10 minutes, you know, my four slides or whatever. Um, now I'd like to show you, you know, one of the things I do when I teach my class. Mm -hmm. So I take this Jeopardy board that I had developed as a legal research review um, mm -hmm. for my lawyering skills class at St. Thomas. 
changed it up, made all the questions and categories about Toledo, and uh, started playing Jeopardy. I'm, you know, the moderator, you know, playing mm -hmm. Alex Trebek. And yeah, this is risky, you know. I mean, this is either going to work or it's going <laughs> to, you know, be the biggest flop in the history of the universe. A little unorthodox. Very unorthodox. Yeah. Well, um, as you say, it might work and it might work in the other direction. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, was, I was feeling pretty good about, you know, uh -huh. the interview. And I, I had a backup if I needed it. Um, but, uh, so we got the game going, and uh, I still remembered maybe two-thirds of the faculty, and, and I'd already met most of the library staff by mm -hmm. that point in the day. You know, so I, I know most of people's names, mm -hmm. um, and I know all the answers because I wrote the questions. Mm -hmm. And the faculty, they just they loved it. Oh. They absolutely loved it. We got to the end of the hour, they didn't want to stop. Uh -huh. Okay, we had questions left on the board, and I'm like, you know, I'm sure some of you have to leave, you know, you got a one o'clock class or whatever, you know, feel free. And they, they stayed put. Mm -hmm. You know, they wanted to see their colleagues miss or something. You know? mm -hmm. um, so that, that was a good day. <laughs> it was a good day. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, they, they made the offer fairly soon after that. So. And I, I needed to delay it a little bit because I was still teaching my class mm -hmm. at St. Thomas, and yeah, I'm, so they wanted to basically have you come kind of right right away. Was that it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They they had had an interim director oh. uh, or or two, I think. And uh, I'm they, surprised. I mean, they in theory knows the, the academic cycle is what it is, and you might mm -hmm. not be quite as readily available. In the middle one. Right, right. And so we, we accommodated each other okay. on that. But yeah, my first day here was March 12th. Uh -huh. So middle of the spring semester. Um, and I didn't take much time in between at all. I think I taught my last class on Tuesday or Wednesday mm -hmm. the prior week. Um, had, uh, you know, some things to finish up, you know, loose ends to, yeah. to tie. So you were able to wrap the course up or transition it to a, a um, new uh, The professor? way we were teaching it at that point was we concentrated all the legal research at the beginning of the semester. Oh, so it worked. Yeah, okay. um, which was a little different than what we'd been doing in prior years. Yeah. Um, uh, and the, the writing professor, uh, Julie Oside, uh, was there. You know, mm -hmm. as had been our practice before, um, but she didn't have me for her half of the class. Yeah. Um, you know, from from March on, and I'm I'm still grading papers and sending things, you know, by FedEx back oh, and sure. forth, and and responding to student questions, and you know, helping them out with the end of semester, you know, project as much as I could mm -hmm. um, from here. Um, but yeah, uh, first day of work is March 12th. Uh, my stuff arrives on the moving truck uh, March 13th, I think it was. And the ABA showed up on March 26th. Well, you got a wild month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we had a, an accreditation uh, site visit uh -huh. uh, two weeks. Although I knew they wanted you to come down here as soon as they could get they, you yes. with the ABA coming up calling. <laughs> yes, and we all knew that. Yeah. You know, and it was it was okay, you know, in the sense, I mean, I wasn't responsible for anything. Uh -huh. you well, know, at that not point. officially. <laughs> but uh, it... Uh, it was uh, a, a good visit, you know, and I definitely, as, as often happens, um, the librarian on the ABA team is also kind of a free consultant, mm -hmm. and if you, you know, get a good relationship with that person, yeah. um, which I, I did, um, it was uh, Kay Andrus. Uh, okay. Creighton, yeah, okay. And uh, he and I had met a couple of times before. Have one of these chats with him before I get home after this trip. It'll, That'll be a yeah, good. Yeah, it should be a lot. That'll fun. be a good one. Kay's an old friend. Um, yeah, and he's he's a good guy. I mean, he's he's one of those people that I have nothing. I will never have anything negative to say about that man. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, that was uh, about as good as a site visit two weeks after you got here. Uh -huh. You know, could could possibly be. And I, I dropped him off at the airport. You know, we so we had a good exit conversation. Oh, and, that's uh, good. And he's still. I mean, you know, less so now I mean you know after a couple of years I actually felt like I halfway knew what I was doing as a director um, you know so I, I I don't you know ask him or Ed or you know questions you yeah. know as much as I used to but they're still available 
It's mm-hmm. one of the things I love about this profession yeah. is, you know, I mean, they're, they're always, you know, nobody ever, you know, tells you to go away, you know, when, when you, you that, ask that a question you need to That is a that uh, many of us have found very much to our liking. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, so you, you came, now you've been running the library, of course, directing the library for about almost 10 years. But you've also mm-hmm. continued your teaching and some of your other activities. Uh, yeah. you want to talk about uh, some of those? Yeah, I, I, I took a couple years off uh, from the teaching uh-huh. when I got here. Um, there were, uh, actually I don't think anybody was teaching advanced legal research mm-hmm. um, at the time. Uh, the model for previous directors here had been that the director taught uh, property. Okay. That's what Janet Wallen had taught, and that's where it fit into the schedule. Um, but uh, we had a property professor, mm-hmm. um, so they, they didn't they didn't need that, and uh, they had also uh, eliminated the associate director position. Oh, uh, okay. Partly for budgetary reasons, mm-hmm. uh, but you know everybody was having budget problems. I think ours just happened a little sooner yeah. than everybody else's. I mean, that was coming up on um, what they call the Great Recession. It was, and, and we sort of took our lumps beforehand. Yeah. You know, there wasn't much left to cut um, when, when the real economic storm hit for everybody uh-huh. later. Um, so, uh, you know, instead of being, you know, spending like half my time running the library and half my time teaching substantive class, uh, they structured the position so I'm supposed to spend most of my time running the library because there is no associate director yeah. to share that responsibility with. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm like, okay, there's stuff I need to get to know here and I need to figure out how this place works and who these people are. And uh, so the teaching was optional mm-hmm. at that point. And it technically still is, although I think I'd have a lot harder time, you know, uh, taking myself out of that mix if I were to do it now. How you and I like perceived it. by your colleagues right. on the faculty would be very different too. Right. And they it was it was kind of strange how much more seriously some of them take me mm-hmm. uh, once they see me in the classroom. Yeah. And uh, You're a stand up teacher. When That's I how went, I used to phrase it when yeah. they talked with me about you know, I was one of them. <laughs> And you know, you, you they evaluate. You know, when I went for a promotion from assistant to mm-hmm. uh, associate, um, you know, when your colleagues come in and they watch you teach and they tell yeah. you you're good at it, and here's a couple things that you might think about doing a little differently. It's like, yeah, you're really a colleague. Yeah. At that point, and until that happens, either you're not really a colleague, or at least you don't know you are. Mm-hmm. Or worse, they don't know you are in reality, well, whatever that makes you. Yeah. 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 So I think that's been a good thing for everybody. So you have taught then more regularly in more recent years? Or? Yeah. Uh, it's every spring. Uh-huh. Um, originally, I figured we'd just uh, teach the advanced class in the spring because there's more 1L volume to okay. deal with in the fall. That is less true uh, recently, the last wow. couple of years, as more of that curriculum has moved online. Um, there's just less for them to do in the library. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're working on different ways to get the 1Ls involved and attached to the library mm-hmm. um, because they're not going to have to be here to do their assignments. I mean, you know, they don't need the index to legal periodicals right. anymore. The, the books you are know, not they, only on got the shelf, online. the shelf is any place they have a computer connection. <laughs> right, right. So we spend a lot of, uh, I've spent a lot of our time in the library, the university's mm-hmm. money, you know, trying to work on spaces that will make the students, you know, want to yeah. come in and, and, and settle in and, and stay put for a mm-hmm. while. Um, it's a it's a different environment than it used to be because yeah. they don't have to be here anymore. No. Um, so you really have to go out there and, and, and do things to, to remind them that we're here and we mm-hmm. exist and we can be very helpful. Yeah. You're also competing with what a lot of law schools have done, which is to create um, areas for students to congregate throughout the uh, mm-hmm. uh, facility. Yeah. 
and with Wi-Fi and digital and so on, those are all library spots. Uh, they are. Yeah, in reality, or they compete with the library for mm -hmm. you know those alternatives. Yeah, I mean, we used to have you know Lexus and Westlaw. You know, they'd have their tables set up, and they would do a lot more. You yeah. know, spend a lot more of their time in the library. Westlaw's pulled back significantly. I think everybody knows that by now. I mean, they don't they don't have printers anymore. They don't have their own room yeah. in the library. Lexus still does. But they spend a lot of their time downstairs in the law school forum. That's our big open congregating mm -hmm. area okay. on the first floor. So uh, you know we've tried to you know get the library into those spaces too. Mm -hmm. you know, we do a meet and greet at the beginning of the semester. You know we add cookies and coffee and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we do it in the library, and sometimes we do it in other spaces. Yeah. In, you in you allow eating in the library. That yes, used to we be do. a big controversy in some well, places. I, I think we have to. Yeah, well, you know, we if did, we didn't, uh, uh, nobody would come in the library at all. Yeah, and yeah. can you have coffee in the library? The answer has got to be yes, too. But, mm -hmm. you know, for a long time, that was not the case in a lot of places. Right. Yeah. Right. I've. Uh, I'm just now thinking of this, uh, especially in the last year or so since we've had uh, our new dean. Mm -hmm. I've been uh, more involved in the space planning and trying mm -hmm. to come up with those kinds of, um, you know, uh, useful spaces for yeah. our students. Um, you know, partially I've got some expertise there. And part of it is out of everybody, you know, on the dean's senior staff, you mm -hmm. know, I seem to be the one who, you know, can... You know, I, I can read blueprints and you know have conversations with with architects and and, and uh, construction people, mm -hmm. and uh, so we just did a classroom renovation. It's not quite finished. Uh, mm -hmm. It's almost finished, and you know I kind of took the lead on that one too. It's totally outside the library, mm -hmm. but uh, I think it's those sorts of things that that we need to be into, or yeah. at least be involved in. You know, maybe not directing the project, but. Um, you know, whatever learning goes on in the building, we should be involved in and mm -hmm. have something to do with. Yeah, and as I sort of alluded to a few minutes ago, it's all sort of library these days because mm -hmm. of what library collections are and how you access them. Right. Yeah. Well, we've talked around about uh, your faculty involvement and the faculty hat you wear, but you know, I had a specific uh, thought or a question that I had posed uh, in the draft for today uh, that to ask you specifically about your views on faculty appointment, uh, regular appointment on the regular teaching faculty for the library director. Yeah, well, I mean that's that's certainly evolving. You know, yeah. I think we're seeing a lot of um, you know situations where you know as the law school you know needs a new library director for whatever reason I think a lot of them are not even wanting to think about you know should this person be tenured or, or tenure track mm -hmm. um, Toledo moved in that direction uh, when I came on uh, I'm on a five-year presumptively renewable okay there are other um, colleagues uh, yeah and, and it's, I know it's, a, similar sorts of it's a hybrid yeah uh, in my case I, I am an animal unto myself mm -hmm. there are two pages in the government rules for the college that have nothing to do with anybody other than me uh -huh. um, but I do uh, I'm the only uh, promotable non tenure track Professor. So in theory, you could go to full professor. I could go to full professor. The understanding within the building, uh, which I mostly agree with, is uh, a significant publication, okay. uh, which would mean an article, book. I know that's one of the catch points for a lot of colleagues uh, as yeah. to what the expectations for tenure would be if they uh, were in that and track. Especially be significant publication. Right. Right now, I do have. Uh, if you you know look closely at our criteria, um, it's a very librarian friendly. Um, you know, they they did um, take into account the the different kinds of things that, that mm -hmm. librarians do, and uh, I or someone else in my position, uh, you know, get credit for that. I think it's reasonably well uh, described. Mm -hmm. um, and the the definition of publication is very broad. Mm -hmm. um, 
it, uh, you know, uh, the other professor's definition of publication is like one sentence, two lines. Mine is like a ten line paragraph. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of a promotion to full professor, they're still looking for an article, you know, something scholarly. So the more traditional, mm -hmm. something in a law review uh, right. type thing? Right. I mean, a, a, a full length piece in Law Library Journal, you know, mm -hmm. would certainly qualify. Yeah. Um, and, and it would be peer-reviewed too, which is something that uh, that's true. Know, <laughs> not true of, of a lot of my colleagues' uh, scholarship. But we try not to make too much noise about that. Well, we don't want to tell provosts and others about this, but you're right. Well, it's students you do that. that review it for a lot of these uh, right. law reviews. Right, and if you mess with that, then you know perhaps the whole house of cards comes tumbling down, and we don't have law schools anymore, and nobody wants that. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, that's always going to be a struggle. Getting yeah. the rest of the university to understand and, and, and try to persuade them, you know, yeah. uh, what what kinds of things we do and, and why we do them. Well, the professional schools, law included, being one of them, have always sort of had to have a little accommodation here and there. I mean, what's mm -hmm. the terminal degree in law? Um, you know, it's not yeah. the PhD. Yeah. No, I mean, there are SJDs, but how many people ever go? You know, to that's right to get them. Yeah, I mean, yeah it is possible. Technically, to get the, the, PhD. the normal terminal degree is the JD, mm -hmm. or just as the MD is in medicine. Well, and it's, DDS. It's, and, it's true in librarianship too. Yeah. Okay, so you know, for those of us with both degrees, mm -hmm. you know, neither one of them is really terminal. Yeah. You know, neither one of them is actually a PhD. I think they're both, you know, certainly valuable and in most cases necessary, at least for for the director job. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it, it's a strange world uh, mm -hmm. that we live in academically. Yeah. Sometimes our colleagues in other disciplines see it sort of their way and are hard to persuade differently. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they look at their own discipline and what's normal is for them is sort of what they think is going to be normal for everybody. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, it's interesting. Now, you have done... You've already alluded to sort of your service to the, uh, uh, at least the law school here. You are out working on planning uh, space and classrooms and stuff. Uh, is there any other of that sort of thing that you'd like to talk about? Uh, where you've sort of, outside of the strict library, where you've been involved in uh, things? Yeah, not, there's not a whole lot else uh, at the university, okay. uh, which is what about the broader kind of, kind of surprising profession? to me because, you know, being an alum of this institution, you know, mm -hmm. I kind of thought maybe I'd be a little more involved, you know, across campus than I, than I really became. Yeah. Um, now, where I uh, focused most of my, you know, energy outside the library, mm -hmm. you know, professionally, service-wise, would be uh, the Ohio Regional chapter, mm -hmm. of which I have been treasurer now for seven years. Yeah, I, I think. Just, I've got somebody um, that doesn't know how to say no and have to do the job well. <laughs> you're still here, you haven't right. run off right. with the money. <laughs> um, well, yeah, and that's, that's the thing, just don't lose any of the money, and you know, chances are, you know, because no, it's, it's hard to find a treasurer, yeah. you know, because there's just so much going on, you know, simultaneously. you got... It can be, yeah. uh, but you know, the longer you do it, you kind of get into a rhythm. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, after a couple of years, I've got a spreadsheet that's got the whole checkbook on it, and everything is coded, yeah. and in some cases, color coded. It makes the annual report a lot easier. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, these two numbers aren't adding up. Why not? Oh, because I left that one out. <laughs> that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, but it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, of an introvert. You know, I definitely lean in. Mm -hmm in that direction, you know, on that scale. But you don't wear a green eye shade when you're doing the no. chapter books. Uh, no, you kind of don't. Yeah, I'm teasing is, you, of course. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a great way to get to know, I mean, everybody oh, in, yeah. in the chapter because, you know, I'm getting a check from every one of them, you know, uh -huh. every year. Uh, you know, those that register for our annual meeting, there's another, you know, potential point of contact. Yeah. And every time one of those transactions happens, I'm typing it you know, in either the checkbook spreadsheet or the membership, mm -hmm. you know, spreadsheet. So after a while, you know, um, you'll see something. Uh, Ohio's got 
a very strong county law library system, which is kind of unusual. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's written into our code. Uh, the county law libraries are partially funded by traffic fines, uh, mm -hmm. among other things. Some of that fine, some of those costs. Well, you mean if I get cost speeding on the uh, turnpike, we will I, thank would, you. I can consider that I'll get a nice appreciation letter from the association or something? Well, it, if you let us know. You know, yeah. that you got this ticket. Well, somehow I, I, I think I'm too sheepish to want I, to fess up. <laughs> I could probably arrange it because I will know who the law librarian is in whichever county between here and Cleveland. Um, With all that said, uh, uh, Rick, I should uh, uh, thank you for being part of today's conversation. And in doing so, I'm not just thanking you on my own behalf. I had the fun of coming here and chatting with you. But also on behalf of uh, Michelle Wu. Uh, Frank Hodak and Dick Spinelli, our colleagues with whom I have the pleasure of, of putting together this oral history of law librarianship for the Hein Online database. Thank you. Thank you.